Um, so since fiscal year 19, we've reduced the state's operating budget, uh, unrestricted general fund operating budget by about 5.1%. Um, so this is a combination of programmatic reductions, small efficiencies, um, major policy changes in the way we finance some state government, some core state government costs. Um, that savings of $247 million combined with uh, revenue, a revenue outlook from December 15th, that's about $235 million stronger than what was available for appropriation in fiscal year 19, has gotten us to a point where we have a fiscal year 23 budget that balances expenditures and revenues within what's available for spending in fiscal year 23. Um, there are kind of a couple of caveats. I'll get to that in, in the next slides on revenue. Um, but really, we're looking at a, a fully balanced budget in fiscal year 23 that allows us to meet you know, both the governor's policy objectives around the permanent fund dividend, as well as our policy objectives around public protection and providing core government, government services out to the state of Alaska. There we go. Um, so just kind of a little more on the major changes we've made between fiscal year 19 and our proposal for 23. Um, like I said, overall UGF budget is down about 5.1%. Um, but when you bring in all state funds, both unrestricted general fund and designated general fund, we're down about 7% in state, in state dollar spending. Um, there's been a couple of changes, I'm sure for those of you watching, um, issues around the CBR sweep and and kind of that political discussion at the legislature um, has resulted in us needing to increase UGF expenditures to ensure programs are, that relied upon these DGF fund sources are fully supported. Um, and that's why, you know, kind of looking at an all state funds picture gives you a better idea of those kind of programmatic and policy changes we've made. Um, within agency operating budgets, we've made about 2.2% reduction. We saved about $100 million in the state's obligation to retirement system payments. Um, and this is while fully funding the actuarial liability to those retirement systems. So this isn't a, you know, a change in what we're paying out to retirees or future retirees. Um, this is simply the, the product of good investment decisions as well as some policy changes that we've made in how we finance those costs. Um, over this time, even with a pandemic that's resulted in a over a third of Alaskans getting on Medicaid, um, our Medicaid UGF budget is actually down about $5 million over this time period. And that accounts for the expiration of enhanced federal participation in the Medicaid program as well. Um, so a lot of good effort by the Department of Health and Social Services to keep those costs in line and, and hold that state share of Medicaid flat. Um, we've reopened highway maintenance stations, um, not everyone, but uh, several very key strategic highway maintenance stations that have been closed during the downturn in revenue we've been able to reopen over the past few years. Um, we've also transitioned the marine highway system to a calendar year budget. And so for technical budget folks, it's a little bit odd. It's not the standard way that we budget for state costs, but we've shifted them to a calendar year budget, which really better aligns with the service delivery that they perform. And we've made some very significant investments in public protection, um, both in the Department of Corrections, Department of Public Safety, as well as prosecution and defense. Um, so focusing in a little more on just the fiscal year 23 budget and comparing that to the fiscal year 22 budget, I'd like to kind of break down the sources of revenue. Um, that's been a pretty big, um, piece of the question and the discussion at the committee table this year between both OMB, the finance committees, and legislative finance discussing you know, how we reflect the money available for appropriation, particularly those monies that are coming in from the federal government through these prior relief packages that we received over the course of the COVID pandemic. So when you look at OMB's reporting on revenue, um, what we're showing here is our standard revenue information, you know, unrestricted revenue from petroleum, non-petroleum, and investment revenue. Percent of market value draw, which is at SB26, 5% draw of a five-year average of the permanent fund. 
Um, that draw statutorily in fiscal year 23 brings in just shy of $3.4 billion. Um, but first we adjust that down for the governor's 50-50 dividend plan. Um, and so that takes that money from the earnings reserve, pays it out as dividends. And then what remains is $1.7 billion roughly um, to be used for government services. Um, and then when we get down to this carry forward and adjustments line, this is really the piece that um, is a little bit different this year. And this is where we're reflecting federal revenues that are able to be used as unrestricted general fund. Um, so as part of ARPA, the America, American Rescue Plan Act at the federal level, it provided the state a billion dollars of revenues that could be used to offset revenue losses during COVID. So effectively unrestricted revenues available for any government service, which is very different than normal federal revenues you would see in a state budget where there's a lot of strings attached and rules at a federal level that dictate how it gets spent. And because of that distinction, we're showing it here as a adjustment to unrestricted general fund revenues. In our budget, we code it um, in a unrestricted general fund expenditure code that's tied to these federal revenues. That's something we worked on with legislative finance last year um, when the legislature chose to use $250 million for revenue replacement. Um, and so that brings us to an available for appropriation um, revenue amount of about $4.6 billion. But the, the important thing to note here um, is that $4.6 billion is based on the December 15th fall revenue sources bill. Um, so state revenue, and I, I'm sure Commissioner Mahoney will, when she comes to you next week, will be able to give a much better detailed explanation of this, but in, in short, um, you know, state revenue is projected on the fall sources book and a spring sources book. Um, but in the fall sort revenue sources book in December, it had a pretty low, low price of oil. And since then, oil has gone up pretty considerably. And so Department of Revenue has released some interim revenue forecasts to help better inform um, the legislative budget process. And so in January, on January 19th, the Department of Revenue increased those forecasts for fiscal year 22 and 23 um, by $281 million in 22 and 466 million in 23. So this $4.6 billion available based on more current information would be closer to you know, $5.1 billion. Um, and that, that'll be pretty important a little bit later on in my presentation when we start looking at that 10 year plan and the balances in our state savings accounts. So looking at a little more back into my area of expertise of ex the expenditure side of the budget, um, the fiscal year 22 to 23 budget is basically flat between the two years. $14.9 million increase into fiscal year 23, which really in state budget terms rounds out to 0%. Um, where that's coming from, on the operating side, we have about $103 million increase or about 2% increase between fiscal year 22 and 23. Primarily that's coming from statewide operating costs. Um, and really the biggest portion of that there is the payment of oil and gas tax credits. In fiscal year 22, the legislature appropriated about a third of the statutory calculation for oil and gas tax credits. And in fiscal year 23, we've proposed to pay 100%. Um, and that's $199 million um, in fiscal year 23. So as a result, that's a pretty considerable year over year increase, but that's just to bring the budget into that, that statutory calculation. Um, additionally, we made some policy decisions in the statewide operations area to fully fund school bond debt reimbursement, as well as the REAA fund. And that makes up the rest of that um, $89 million increase. The $116 million decrease there in retirement is a result of very strong market conditions that have created strong earnings in the retirement system funds and the policy decision voted on by the arm board uh, where they chose not to fund the healthcare portion of the retirement fund as it's cap where it's funded at over 100% of the actuarial calculation of the necessary funding level. On the agency side, um, agency non-formula operations, those are your 
core government service work that's done in the departments are down about $22 million. Um, a lot of this is because of savings in the healthcare um, system actually pass on to savings in agency operating budgets as a result of a, a policy change the administration made that allows us to assign retirement system costs better to activities that, that generate that cost over time. Um, the $22 million reduction in non-formula is balanced out by an increase in agency formula programs. Um, so primarily this is an increase in the Medicaid program. Um, going into fiscal year 23, currently we're projecting that the federal enhanced um, Medicaid match rate or FMAP um, will expire at the end of this state fiscal year. Um, and that enhanced rate has been coming in during the COVID pandemic to help states deal with the additional you know, cost to Medicaid of all the people that lost their jobs through the pandemic and have had you know, increased health costs borne by these state public assistance programs. Um, we project that will expire um, and then that will in turn cause an increase in state's share. Um, but even with that increase in state's share, we still see a Medicaid program that's flat since fiscal year 19. So it's a bottom line, our surplus here in fiscal year 23, based on the lower December forecast is about $27 million. Um, that surplus based on the more up-to-date forecast in January would be about $490 million. Um, the reason that we continue to show here the, the fall forecast is that's really the you know, official forecast. We're trying to kind of keep, keep that standard that we've followed for years and you know, but providing that additional information from these updated forecasts, I think it helps, helps understand the, the changing nature of state revenues that kind of, you know, creates some of those, you know, pressures during legislative session as we work through these issues. Um, so one big area of state spending that we've been trying to address both in last year's budget and this year's budget is capital spending. Um, this graph here, you can see that state capital budgets have been rather low for the last, you know, eight or so years or you know, seven years um, since about 2015. Um, in 2013, we had sort of record high capital budgets, and then subsequent to revenue, uh, the revenue, the drop in revenue to the state, capital budget really was the first thing to go. And so those capital budgets from 16 through 21 really were just the bare minimum to match to federal programs or to satisfy some very high priority um, core capital needs. There really wasn't much to address um, you know, more discretionary or you know, maintenance on state facilities or rebuilding of dilapidated facilities or addressing other capital infrastructure needs for the state. Um, and so in light of that and recognizing that pent up demand in fiscal year 22, we propose a fairly robust capital spending package. And again, here in fiscal year 23, we're making a very similar proposal with a little bit of a different angle on how we're prioritizing projects. So our overall proposal for the fiscal year 23 capital budget is about $2.1 billion, but that's inclusive of the standard federal programs, things like the surface transportation program or village safe water. Um, with state money, just when you just look at the state money, it's just shy of $720 million um, in state funds. And those really come from four main sources. Um, we utilized some of the surplus projected for fiscal year 22, about $93 million. And that's to address projects that have a more um, urgent need to them or have some benefit from an earlier funding date that would allow for more timely start and completion of those projects. Um, we have a general obligation package um, with about a little over $300 million in um, bond financed projects. Um, this, this year, this is a, you know, another a new geo bond package, really. Last year, we had introduced one, but it had a much different um, flavor to the way that the projects were selected and prioritized. This year, um, we really looked at trying to do a better job of working with communities on what community priorities are. You know, this is really a good avenue um, to 
satisfy some of the pent up demand that communities have, um, as well as the state has for a lot of projects around the state. Um, and so you'll see that those projects there in the general obligation bond um, primarily came from requests or priority lists from communities around the state. Uh, we've also used $136 million of those discretionary federal revenues uh, that I spoke of to fund some prioritized projects they're more on the state side, but also some community needs that we've seen and have been brought to our attention. And then there's normal state funds. And these are our standard capital projects, uh, the match on federal funds, some designated general fund projects for things like ferry maintenance and, and things of that nature. The kind of your more um, standard year over year capital projects. But all in all, it, it adds up to a, a capital budget proposal that's larger than, than what we've seen appropriate really last seven years. On the operating budget, we were able to craft an operating budget that accommodated the governor's 50-50 dividend plan without any use of savings draws or a deficit. Um, it's able to balance current year available revenues against current year necessary expenditures. Um, and as you'll see in some of our later slides, you know, our, our longer term fiscal plan it is able to accommodate that plan and those constitutional amendments that we've proposed um, within the, the term of the, of the tenure plan. Um, we also sought to mitigate the impacts of the CBR suite. Um, so there are a lot of fairly critical programs to Alaskans that you know, Alaskans highly value that over the last several years have gotten kind of caught up in a political discussion around the nature and structure of state funds. Um, and so when we built our budget for fiscal year 23, we wanted to try to divorce those two issues. Um, for one, the CBR sweep was not reversed in the fiscal year 22 budget. The legislature wasn't able to reach the two third uh, or sorry, three quarter majority in order to reverse the sweep. Um, but also we want to make sure that these programs and the, you know, the, the need for the programs could be separated from that more political discussion about the nature of state finances and the structure of these funds. And so the result, we used about um, 30 to $40 million in unrestricted general funds to ensure that all of those programs could manage even without a reversal of the sweep. Um, in K-12 education, we fully funded the base student allocation, which adds up to about $1.2 billion or the largest single um, state operating budget expenditure. Um, we've also fully funded school bond debt and REAA. Um, this really is looking at you know, where that impact of short funding school bond debt, it's really is um, municipal property taxpayers. And since there's available revenues here in fiscal year 23, you know, we're able to provide that relief to those, those municipal property taxpayers. Um, and then we sought to utilize the available federal funding to maximize benefit to Alaska, both by preserving unrestricted general funds for future state needs, as well as investing in economic development opportunities around the state. Um, a little more about the operating budget. We, the one place where we've used federal infrastructure dollars from the, the EJA, as we call it, the um, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, is in the Alaska Marine Highway System. There's a new program in that bill called the Real, Rural Ferry Program, which provides for funding for the operating operations of rural ferry systems, of which the Marine Highway System is one of two that we can find that qualify in the state. And so we're anticipating a fairly significant amount of money coming in for the, the ferry system that will allow for us to use, use that money to run a larger or a more robust schedule than has been in the past. Um, we've also made investments in state primacy over resources, expanding a timber program um, throughout the state that previously was piloted here in Southeast Alaska, um, and also to assume primacy over resource development permitting in the Department of Environmental Conservation. We have over $30 million in operating unrestricted general fund increments for public protection. Um, there's both 15 new trooper positions, the $7.3 million People First initiative um, that spans issues around domestic violence, sexual assault, missing and murdered peoples, and homelessness. 
There's also investments in the Department of Corrections and support staff for our law enforcement. Um, we've also created a new department, um, splitting the Department of Health and Social Services into the Departments of Family and Community Services and the Department of Health. Um, and we think this will bring better executive leadership focus to these various areas and, and better management and in turn better service delivery. Um, so another kind of big issue, especially over the last uh, week or so, um, as we've been able to kind of provide some more information, has been this Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act. Um, so the state has appointed an infrastructure coordinator who is you know, really tasked with making sure that we have a, a full understanding of the benefit to Alaska out of this infrastructure bill, what it is and what it isn't. Um, what we've started to find is there's not a whole lot of state discretionary um, funding coming in through this infrastructure bill. There's a lot of great programs for the state of Alaska and money coming in for the state of Alaska, but most of it's being prioritized at the federal level. Um, there's a lot of state coordination that needs to be done though, and there will be you know, opportunity for the state and communities to have input in these programs. Um, but ultimately a lot of it's going to be look a lot more like a standard federal program that we see in the in the state's budget, where there's you know rules and guidelines set by the federal government that then have to be implemented by the state. Um, we're really not seeing things like we've seen in those prior relief bills where there's large amounts of discretionary money coming to the state to be divvied up and used for economic um, recovery and health response. And this really isn't a relief bill. It's more of a standard federal reauthorization of programs with um, additional new programs on top of it. Um, so as a result, we haven't included any, except for the Marine Highway System, any of these items in our operating or capital budget. Um, but we do intend to release a, another appropriation bill that will address what we know and, and what we know is coming into the state. Um, so kind of more forward looking, um, this slide was just kind of a big wall of numbers um, is our 10 year fiscal outlook. Um, and one thing I'd like to, to draw some attention to, I mentioned earlier the Department of Revenue released updated revenue forecasts on um, January 19th. And so these orange rows that you see here reflect that updated revenue forecast. Um, so when you look at the updated forecast, you can see in fiscal year 23, the final surplus is closer to $500 million than it is $27 million we thought it would be in um, December. And that allows us to put additional funds into the constitutional budget reserve, the state's primary savings account. Um, and when we look at this projection and we look at the long-term outlook of the state um, and the sort of the structural deficit, you know, we're looking at this going forward, seeing the structural deficit kind of slowly disappear. Um, but we know that because there, there are currently projected deficits based on, on Department of Revenue's revenue projection and, and what we think state spending will be in the future, um, we look at that balance in the CDR to see is that balance adequate to weather through you know, these small deficits we have in the next couple of fiscal years and kind of right the ship and, and send the state back in a, a better direction. And the kind of the, the goal number or sort of floor number for the constitutional budget reserve is about a billion dollars. And the reason for that is about $500 million is needed at any given time to just deal with cash flow needs of the state. And so that billion dollars gives you both some cash flow needs as well as another, you know, level of comfort in case you know revenue projections are you know are wrong in a in a negative way um and so that that gives us a bit of a buffer to work through this and with the most recent revenue projections you know, we're looking at a minimum balance of about 1.8 billion dollars in the cdr um the other thing i'd like to note you can see in the first two orange rows that those update revenue projections only really impact two fiscal years, um, fiscal year 22 and 23. Um, the Department of Revenue hasn't yet done an update for the entire term of the 10-year plan, but based on the futures market, we expect that 
when they do do that update as part of the spring revenue sources book, that we'll see increased outlook for um, traditional revenues in years fiscal year 24 through 32. Um, so in closing, you know, there's you know, a lot that we've put into the fiscal year 23 budget, but there's still a lot of work left to be done. Um, the administration has three constitutional amendments that are you know, really integrated into our overall fiscal plan. Um, SJR 5 is an appropriation limit, and the state currently has an appropriation limit set in the Constitution, as well as an appropriation limit set in statute. Um, but the appropriation limit we currently have really is, is ineffective at constraining cost of gross in government. Um, it, it really just allows for expenditures to skyrocket with, with revenues when that happens and really doesn't provide very much constraint to, to increase in state expenditures. And so we've tried to craft an appropriation limit that would allow for necessary government growth, you know, for normal cost pressures and normal changes in cost of doing business, but would prevent that sort of exponential growth that you see in some years when there's significant revenue increases. And we also have SGR 6, which is the constitutionalization of the permanent fund dividend, as well as constitutionally protecting the earnings reserve and putting the percent of market value draw into the constitution. And that would ensure that that money in the permanent fund and in the earnings reserve is not available for appropriation outside a reasonable draw from the constitution. And it also provides for kind of resolution. One of the bigger political issues that's faced um, the state's fiscal policy, and that is the permanent fund dividend. Um, and then SJR 7, um, which is a constitutional amendment that will require voter approval of any new state tax. More on the technical budget side, you know, future issues that we here at OMB know are things that we have to work on over the coming years that are you know, areas that require some constant vigilance. Um, the Alaska Marine Highway System, we have this federal money coming in from the infrastructure bill. Right now it's guaranteed for five years, but we wanna make sure that we use that opportunity to build a system that's um, transitions to a system that's more robust and um, capable of supporting itself in the long term. Um, we don't want to end the five years and, and still have a, a system that, um, you know, is, it, it's just too big and, um, and incapable of supporting itself in the long run. We want a healthy marine highway system out of this. Um, Medicaid cost containment will always continue to be a challenge that requires you know, constant attention and constant um, negotiation and work with federal partners as well as the medical communities throughout the state. Um, and the post sweep transition of designated funds, um, since the sweep wasn't reversed this last year, you know, I spoke of the budget changes that we made here for fiscal year 23, but we know that those are very um, temporary changes. It's, it's sort of putting a you know, an initial fix in that will work for fiscal year 23, but some of the programs have been reliant on those funds. You know, the structure behind those programs needs to be investigated to ensure that you know, they, they can continue in the long term and that the financing structure is appropriate for the program itself. Um, and just the general work on governmental efficiencies over time. Um, I mentioned a bit one, you know, significant reform that that has been passed and enacted was SB 55 last year. Um, and this allowed us to take some of those retirement system costs that were being paid solely by the state and start charging our federal partners and other partners for some of those costs because they do go to supporting the programs paid for by these uh, federal funds. Um, and so that's the conclusion of my you know, prepared slides, and I'm happy to answer any questions or dive into discussion on any of these topics that, that you would like. All right, great. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, Cheryl, I'm going to bring you in to see if you have any initial questions while folks put their um, questions in chat.
You're on mute, Cheryl. Some people wish they could do that in real life. <laughs> um, just with a button. Um, so thank you, Neil, very much for the uh, informative overview. And I, I appreciate all the balancing um, challenges you've had to um, um, put together. Um, one thing, uh, just on your one of the slides early on, you talked there was a supplemental number uh, for 22. And so, you know, it, uh, it's easy to propose a budget that's less, but then, um, you know, you work through the after the legislature leaves and you don't in, the, the decreases that you planned don't get implemented and they come back as a supplemental. So so what is what's in the supplemental um, for 22 and um, um, and is this a practice that you think will go forward as, as you build your 10 year plan? Yes, thank you for the question, Cheryl. So. Um... When you look at the supplementals that we propose, there's kind of a couple of different categories that you can put them in. Um, so we have the supplementals where it is, you know, an unforeseen need. You know, you budgeted at one level, costs came in higher, something happened within the program that results in a supplemental need. Um, a great example of that in our budget this year is um, the parks division at DNR. Um, they they base their budget off of one assumption of revenue coming in. As a result of COVID, they've seen significant shortfalls in parks revenue. And as a result, that revenue is not able to fully, fully support the operations needed. So we've had to request unrestricted general fund supplemental. So that's a great example of a you know, unforeseen event, a couple hundred thousand dollars that, that we need in supplemental. We've also, when we were putting together the December 15th budget, we went through a, an exercise of prioritization of you know, policy initiatives, budget asks from the departments, areas of necessary investment. And then once we determine, you know, here's, here's what needs to be supported, here's where the true needs are, we then look to find out how to finance some of that. And when we were going into the December 15th budget, you know, we knew we had, you know, better than last year, but still constrained revenue in fiscal year 23 but we'd seen a very significant increase, over a billion dollar increase in fiscal year 22 revenues from when the budget was actually enacted um, for fiscal year 22 at the end of the last legislative session. And so that surplus, we were able to use that surplus to finance some of those budget needs that, that we identified during the process. And these are all things that are one-time capital investments, things of that nature. Um, not ongoing costs. Um, so that's kind of an important distinction in just in the way the state budgets is, you don't want to use supplemental revenues and supplemental appropriations to finance ongoing costs. Um, and so the, the areas that we finance with those supplementals, they're one-time costs, they're capital projects, um, trying to, you know, really goes back to that slide on historical capital budget and the depressed historical capital budgets creating so much pent up demand, both within state agencies and in communities around the state. And so that opportunity to utilize some of that surplus in fiscal year 22 to satisfy some of those needs, it was something that we kind of had to take advantage of. Um, however, you know, that said, we made sure we didn't spend every penny. We wanted to make sure that there's money left over that can go back into our savings is looking to the future, you know, <laughs> you know, we have the present, but we also have to really be cognizant of 10 year fiscal plan. You know, it's, it, it's something that Alaska uniquely is very focused and thinks about and is very important to any of these bigger discussions we have. So leaving some money on the table in 22, allowing that to go into the CBR to ensure there's money there for future budgets was an important consideration as well. So when I, if I may follow up just real quick. So did you, in terms of, I appreciate your concerns about using um, uh, what could be considered one-time revenues, high, uh, higher revenues for one-time expenditures, but what about using the federal funds to supplant state funds for recurring costs in terms of the operating budget? Other, setting aside the marine highway system, that's one you know big 
bucket. But what about did what did you do in uh, applying other federal funds to operating or recurring costs? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. That's actually something that's come up a lot in committee discussions is how we reflect that federal unrestricted revenue. Um, so the federal unrestricted revenue that came in, the, the federal government intended that as something to backfill lost revenues in as a result of COVID. And so when we look at this money coming in, it's not necessarily, yeah, traditional revenue source you'd have every year. It's kind of akin to a short-term increase in price or production oil or something along those lines. You know, it is to an extent a windfall, but it's a windfall intended to support operating costs. And so what we're trying to do in the way that we're using it, using you know, $375 million of it in as unrestricted general fund revenue and counting it that way, is we want to make sure that we're not necessarily taking that federal revenue that comes in, spending it on a bunch of new things, and then having it drop off and disappear next year. Instead, we are using it as unrestricted general fund revenue to support state operations to not grow spending, but to just support baseline operations. It does drop off in the next year, and you can see that in our revenue projections. No, it's, but it's available here now to be used. Um, I think there's kind of the, the notion that it shouldn't be used on ongoing operating costs is sort of a slippery slope to the argument that, oh, we should spend it on you know, things we wouldn't have spent unrestricted general fund on to begin with and spend it on new spend, sort of that, oh, we get a windfall and we buy a bunch of luxuries type you know, idea. And we're really looking to avoid that in, in that use of the federal funds. And that's why we think programming them into the operating budget this way and encourages that sinking of it as just unrestricted general fund revenue that it needs to be when those dollars are spent, it should be in the same way you would consider a proposal to spend unrestricted general fund. I think that's the important takeaway that I hope is, you know, it's fairly clear to people as, as you're thinking about how this money gets used. Okay. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Cheryl and Neil. Um, we have some questions in chat. Um, I, I will just remind the audience that if you want to um, ask questions, you can type them into chat. Um, you can turn on your camera and wait for me to call on you as well. Um, so either one of those is an option. Um, Neil, we have a question uh, from Elise Galvin, who's online with us. She's asking, um, you know, the governor, how has inflation specifically been uh, incorporated or thinking about inflation been incorporated into um, the way you've developed the budget and uh, the state uh, business going forward? And she's specifically citing, uh, of course, education, noting that the base student allocation hasn't changed in uh, at least the last five years. Um, and you know, for everybody online, uh, the state budget process is one of the more <laughs> lengthy budget processes, I think, ever. They, the call for the next fiscal year usually comes out shortly after the end of the fiscal session, and so, uh, or the legislative session, sorry. And uh, so it is a very lengthy time. And as Cheryl noted, you know, once the time, once it gets to the point where everybody else wants to start talking about it, everybody in state government has just had enough of talking about the budget. But at any rate, Neil, could you address that? How has the budget reflected uh, the, the likelihood of inflation and uh, costs moving forward into FY23? Sure, certainly. Um, so inflation obviously is a, you know, topic of conversation and negotiations with bargaining units. Um, so we have cost of living adjustments for state employees and in, in many of the bargaining units factored into the fiscal year 23 budget and into our, our 10 year plan. Um, so those are, you know, while not solely, you know, based on inflation there, that's a consideration in those negotiations. Um, so we have accommodated that on the state employee side. Um, in our 10 year plan, specifically for K-12 education, um, when we projected those costs out forward, we used one and a half percent cost escalation. I want to be kind of clear, our cost escalation and projections of inflation are kind of two different things. Um, 
we use cost, we want to be careful to make sure it's clear that it's cost escalation because there's a lot of other factors that drive government spending other than inflation. Um, you know, one thing that I like to point out, and I, I don't have it in my slides, but when you look at the history of the state budget and you line it up, state spending, you line it up next to inflation and population growth, and there's no correlation. But if you line it up next to available revenues, it's perfectly correlated. <laughs> available revenues go up, spending goes up. And so when we're looking at trying to project a you know, policy-based spending assumptions going forward, you know, we look at what's the constraint on revenue going to be? Will there be, you know, are we projecting a significant increase in revenue, which would make room for a significant increase in spending? Or are we projecting constrained revenue? You know, when we put together the 10-year plan, you know, you can see by the, the baseline deficits at the end, you know, in, in many of the years, we are projecting constrained revenue. Um, and so we know that, you know, the policymakers will have to make pragmatic policy decisions based on available revenues. Um, I know that isn't getting quite specific to the K-12 side. So, you know, on the K-12 foundation formula side, we are projecting, you know, based on the current VSA, um, there's not a proposal from the administration right now to change that. However, we did factor in that one and a half percent cost growth factor. And that's kind of important because when you look at population trends um, and the population projections that were available on December 15th, it's fairly flat for student age populations throughout the term, throughout the 10-year term. And so with the flat student population and the same BSA, you know, it would be reasonable to project a flat funding of $1.2 billion forward. But we've added in that one and a half percent because, you know, for one, we've seen a big shift recently from brick and mortar schools to correspondence schools, which has decreased the cost of, of delivering of a delivery of education and the resultant formula. And we wanted to ensure that there is room for that to shift back, should it? You know, the policy of the administration is to, you know, we definitely encourage you know, the school choice and the move to correspondence as a positive thing, but we wanted to make sure in our budget projections that there is that opportunity for a shift back post COVID. But that also makes sure that in our outlook, you know, while there's no current policy proposal to change the cost of education, if one were to come in, it's not totally unaccounted for in our 10 year projection because, you know, we can't predict what an administration five years from now is going to be. Um, so we, we feel like we've put enough room in there to consider some of those issues. Um, and but, yeah, I think the takeaway should be you, we're trying to be very considerate of what really drives what really drives spending at the state. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, certainly as we move into the future and, and I think there's going to continue, continue to be adjustments in, in terms of operating profiles and, and uh, you know, business models in terms of how uh, all kinds of different public services are delivered. So I think it will be a, an ongoing exercise in uh, figuring out how to best budget for those. And um, Neil, we have uh, Alex Hills online with us today, and he's asking a couple of questions about the uh, Office for uh, Coordinating the uh, Federal Infrastructure Grants. And he's asking if you could estimate uh, what the appropriation for creating that office will be and when that might be introduced. And then a, a second question is, how will that office be tasked with minimizing future operating expenses uh, for that new infrastructure? So. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I can't really give a specific amount of money that it's going to cost. I mean, we have various various programs in the infrastructure bill that we've seen have set asides for operating. Um, some, you know, one percent, some as high as five percent. Um, but knowing which of those will actually require that level of funding, we're really we're really not at that stage. Um, there are a couple where. You know, we're getting, we're doing that technical work, working with the departments to determine you know, how many staff will this take. And we're hoping to have in the next couple of weeks, you know, a, an actual package to put in front of the legislature to request authorization for those federal funds. 
Um, but to the second part of the question, you know, the we're really trying to be conscientious of not creating ongoing obligations for the state once this federal money, if this federal money drops off. Um, some of these programs look like they may be new programs that could last forever, um, or at least, you know, as good as forever is in state budgeting. Um, but you think about like the surface transportation program, the STEM, um, that's authorized for five years every time, but it is always re -authorized. And so some of these programs may end up falling into that category. Some may drop off in five years. And so when I spoke earlier a little bit about the marine highway system and the need for uh, continued review, you know, right now that federal money is five-year money. And we want to make sure, you know, if it extends, that's great. That's awesome for the system, but that helps the state a lot. If it drops off, we want to make sure we end that five years with a system that's manageable, that doesn't dump a large burden onto the state budget at the end of the five years. And we want to make sure that that conversation continues to be active, so it also doesn't surprise policymakers in five years if it needs to become a, a state obligation again. Sure. And I, I noticed that um, I actually have a question. I did yeah. see um, Mr. Sadler sent me some questions that were direct to me, so oh. I might uh, <laughs> if you oh, mind. Sure. If I yeah, go ahead. Um, so uh, Dan asked about the general obligation bond package and the indebtedness capacity of the state. Um, so the most recent uh, report on the state's debt capacity put our debt capacity about $1.3 billion. Um, so that 300 million easily fits within that, um, you know, in terms of not consuming too much of the debt capacity um, and not leaving the state kind of in a lurch if it needs to access debt uh, at a future date for an unanticipated um, thing to come up. So, so we're in good shape there. I know Devin Mitchell can give a lot of detail on how the state's debt work and works, and you know, I, I'm pretty trusting in those numbers from that debt report. Um, the other thing uh, he asked if the figures in the ten-year plan are nominal or inflation adjusted. They are nominal, so we're using nominal dollars um, out forward. Um, and then the repayment of the constitutional budget reserve. Um, and whether we have a you know, plan or provision in our budget to refill the CBR. Um, so the way that we're addressing it in our budget is the budget's effectively silent on, on where the surplus goes. And so as a result, per the constitutional um, language, that budget surplus would flow into the CBR at the end of the fiscal year. And so based on the current revenue projections, that would be you know, in the order of $800 million going into the CBR over 22 and 23. Um, I wanna roll back up uh, a little bit to the uh, question about the uh, office for the infrastructure grants. Um, there's also a proposal to develop an office for bra broadband development uh, within the, um, I believe in the governor's office or commerce, but could you uh, speak to that? Because there's really a, an important level of uh, broadband funding that's above and beyond um, the uh, recovery funds that are available that will be coming into the state. So uh, what's the status of that office for broadband development? And um, so that's one of the things that we are actively working on that proposal to be put in front of the legislature um, for that office with the Department of Commerce and um, the infrastructure coordinator, Miles Baker, who I'm sure would be very happy to come and talk, talk to the group. Um, I'll volunteer him up all day. Um, <laughs> he's been he's been very you know, hands on with this, and the you know the plan right now is to try and stand up the office to get the initial work done, not have it be a long term, you know, kind of that long term burden in the state because this is a you know sort of one time project, but there is you know significant. You know, anywhere from 100 million to a billion coming to the state itself. And then I've heard numbers as high as 1.5 billion coming to other entities around the state. And that's a lot of a lot of funding to coordinate. There's a lot of mapping that needs to be coordinated across the different stakeholders to ensure that we have the information to make sure that we adequately qualify for those federal dollars. So we'll be coming out with some more robust plan than what I can 
you know, talk about today in, in the coming All right, great, thank you. Um, Barbara Haney is on with us today from Fairbanks and she's asking, uh, how do you see the budgetary impact of the, the changing organizational structure for the ferry system? She references a public corporation. Um, I don't think that specific decision has been made yet, but, but how do you see long-term the budgetary impact of the marine highway evolving? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've heard that, that kind of talk as well. We don't have any specific proposal yet to introduce on on the outcome of some of these discussions with you know, the new MTAB board and the reshaping study that was done. Um, the federal money coming in though, it, it provides a significant opportunity because that money coming in from the federal government will, at the dollar value that we're expecting to get, will allow us to cover almost the entirety of the cost of the marine highway system with an enhanced schedule without having to dip into the Marine Highway System Fund and the, the receipts, the actual ridership fare box receipts. And so over that time span, if we're able to you know, bank those fare box receipts or use them to make you know, strategic investments that you know, could you know, change, the, change the way the ports interact or change the boats, you know, update and modernize, you know, any of those kind of different ideas that are floating around that, you know, we need to kind of land on the plan, but you know, at the end of that five-year period, if the federal program does expire and we've been able to bank some of those funds, that's a good nest egg for that system to operate off of in whatever form it ends up at the end of the five-year term. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity here, and that's where you know, that's why this is on that list of you know, future budget topics that OMB is really keeping an eye on because it's a lot of opportunity and yeah, and we want to make sure it's done right. Absolutely. Well, I'll just uh, add a note that the uh, Alaska Marine Operations Board has its first uh, official meeting uh, tomorrow, all day tomorrow. So uh, stand by for more. Um, Ralph Townsend is online with us and he's asking, why doesn't Alaska do a formal risk analysis around future, future oil prices and permanent fund returns? And uh, yeah, editorial note, the one thing we, we can be certain of is that those forecasts are going to be wrong. So if you're just <laughs> developing one, based on one, so. Yeah, that's uh, the one thing we know about trying to project the future is that we're wrong. Um, <laughs> we're hoping we're not that wrong, but we're wrong. Um, I, would, I would say that actually would be a really good question to ask Commissioner Mahoney when she's um, with you guys next week. I know there's, uh, now Monte Carlo analysis done by the Department of Revenue. Um, they do, I've had them run risk analysis on various topics um, in the past um, for things that were just of interest in the budget development process. So I know there is some of that kind of activity being done and she could give you know, a lot more information about you know, what they do and, and how it informs their forecasting. Great. Well, let me let me make one more call for any last questions. Anybody with their camera on want to ask a question? Okay, well, not I'm not seeing any, Neil. I think you've you must have satisfied this hungry horde of <laughs> budget <laughs> budget hawks. So uh, let me uh, call on Cheryl to come back for any closing remarks, Cheryl. Oh, thank you, Wynette. And again, thank you, Neil, very much for um, sharing your time with us, your lunch with us, and uh, for the work you're doing to try to balance all the competing needs. And um, we'll ask the group that if you have any other questions or topics you'd like for us to discuss with Neil or uh, follow up or uh, other members of the administration, you know, please let Wynette or me know. And uh, we'll be glad to um, see what we can do to advance continued discussion of these important choices and trade-offs that the governor's office and the legislature are facing and the decisions they will be making. Um, so with that, thank you all. Uh, hope to see you next Tuesday when we have Commissioner um, Mahoney uh, joining us to talk about many of the topics that came up today. Um, so with that, thank you again and uh, see you then. Thank you.